Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome here uh, to the workshop on Tao transformation. Um, so just to give you a brief of Genesis, I've been doing this as a talk, and uh, when I discussed this uh, with Naresh, he said, why don't we convert this to a workshop? And today we are here, collaborating together on um, this one. It's been fun working together on this, and uh, Naresh brings in the entire workshop element to this uh, talk to make it more tangible. Okay, so jump straight into it. So Agile Manifesto uh, talks about individual interactions over processes and tools. We've, we've, and Agile is a social engineering experiment, as we all know. Um, but, um, you know, we've addressed interactions a lot, but we haven't addressed individuals yet, to the fullest extent. Is that, that's what I feel. So today, uh, we're going to talk about transformation in light of the human being. Okay? So that's, that's the individual. To, to kick this off, um, I would like to begin with the mother's uh, quote, to know is good, to live is better, to be, that is perfect. The first one, to know, is at a mind level. To live, it's kind of, it has gone into you to some extent, and you're, you're, you're living your, in, a, in a daily life in that way. But then, to be, it's fully assimilated into you. That is where the whole transformation has been kind of complete. So, going further on this, um, let's talk about values, principles, and practices. So. What, what really is value? Well, we all know uh, what value we value. And at the end of the day, that forms the basis of our behavior and action. The next is principles. Well, principles are the glue. They help us uh, you know, transform uh, the value into action. And finally, we have practices where it's the actual application uh, of the belief. And, and obviously they are actions in themselves. So, just to talk about the examples here. Okay, so when you talk about unit test, right? Uh, we all do uh, test-driven development at a practice level. But what's the real principle? Fail fast. And what's the value in there? To get feedback as early as possible. I mean, this is just one of the things that obviously more uh, to unit testing, but that's one way to look at it. The other way to, uh, other example to look at is self-documenting code. I mean, why do we write self-documenting code? Why is there so much emphasis on self-documenting code? I think the reason we put so much emphasis on self-documenting code is because we value declarative expression. We want uh, it to be easy for anyone to look at it and just understand what's going on, right? And the core value behind that is communication. We, we put a lot of value on communication. So, you know, these are kind of a couple of quick examples to think about. So, uh, let's ask this. How many of uh, you practice TDD? Quite a lot, right? Uh, does it by itself lead to a testable, <coughs> decoupled, and a simple design? by itself? Well, I don't think so, right? And then I want the question, is your TDD a practice or a ritual? How do we know that? So today is, is where we're going to find out what is a ritualistic way of doing TDD, what's a practice way of doing TDD, and, and eventually take it down to the values level. Yeah. So, Again, this is not the perfect example, but we just picked a simple example that can help uh, communicate the concept. And we're going to try and do a little bit of uh, uh, demonstration here of how we go about applying test driven development on this specific problem. Right? So it's a simple problem. I'm sure everyone in India at least would be aware of this, right? the different tax labs and how you pay taxes based on this lab. I mean, you can com complicate this a lot more, but for the purpose of this exercise, I think this is good enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly jump to the IDE, 
and take this as an example to uh, show how we do test-driven development on this. So there we go. I would okay. Let's increase this a little bit. So. Good. All right, so what I have here is an empty project, which is not very really easy to see, but it doesn't matter because it's empty. <laughs> There's not much to it. Uh, so I'm going to start with, you know, test-driven development says that you're going to start with, uh, you know, a test. And we're going to practice what I refer to as the inside-out test-driven development, which is we're going to start at the unit level, and we're going to gradually build it out. There are other styles of doing test-driven development, but we're going to focus on the uh, inside-out style of doing test-driven development. So what is my first test? Anyone? Come the agile, the demo. So we're going to talk, we are talking about uh, tax calculation, right? So I'm going to start with tax calculator test. How about that? What do you think, Dalal? Makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, this is the way to do it. All right, what is my first test? Let's quickly flip back here. Let's, let, let's look at the specification we have here for a second. That's the specification we have, and it says the easiest one I can think of is, you know, if, if it is income is zero to two lakhs, then zero tax, wow, and you basically take everything home. So if your income is 10,000, you take 10,000 home. So what, we, what shall we call this test? Well, let's say income less than two lakhs. Uh, income less than two lakhs. Does not attract tax. No tax. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what are we going to do? So we're going to start with uh, writing an assert statement to explain what exactly we expect back. So I'm going to say assert equals. What do I expect back? I expect back. Let's say ten thousand, which was the take home. And I'm going to say uh, calculator dot take home? income tax. After no, take home after income tax. Take, sorry, take home after income tax. And I'm going to pass ten thousand to this. Uh, control one. Create a local variable. This is what shall we call this? Calculate income tax calculator, maybe. Okay, income. Maybe we can make this generic, right? It could do any kind of tax. So how about tax calculator? Okay. Makes sense. Tax calculator. Tax calculator. And actually it's complaining. We don't have one. So we're going to go ahead and create it. And I'm just going to put it in my source code. And then complaints. I don't have this method. So I'm going to just go ahead and create this method. And this basically returns a double, mm -hmm. and it takes a double, which is your income, and that should work. We need to, we need to pass in the precision, and actually we don't even need this guy, so yeah. let's right. do that, static should do. So that makes it static. That works. And what shall we do for this? We'll return whatever. Just yeah. return income. Yeah. If there's no taxes. Oh, bug and eclipse. Doesn't work. First time we have to run it this way. And then, sure enough, my IDE will run. Okay. So, we've got the first test passing. Yeah. Yes! What did you guys think about that? Mind-blowing, right? We're practicing TDD. Yes. No? <laughs> Come on, this has to be interactive. <laughs> well, we didn't fail first. 
right? We should have failed first. So this is bad. Let's do that. Right? Let's return zero. Let's run the test. Yes, we got a failing test. Yeah, and yeah. now let's do the simplest thing that could possibly work. And there it is. So red bar, green bar, refactor. We, we don't write any code that needs refactoring. <laughs> right? Is there any value in this test that we wrote? Is there any value in this test we wrote? Documented the first specification. Documented the first specification, right? But the problem is tomorrow the government will change 2 lakhs to 2.5 lakhs or 3 lakhs. And then this test will not really work. Of course it will not work because you've changed the specification, but should your test really reveal the implementation detail. In this case, it's really talking about income tax less than 2 lakhs, no tax. Right? So it's probably a bad test name. And what about our design? What do you think about the design? It's none. Sorry? It's hmm? none. There's no design. Yes, true. <laughs> There was, there was some design, we, we thought about tax calculator, we thought maybe in future this will do all kinds of tax calculations, and so there was a little bit of design, but frankly this is just crap. This is a total waste of time, right? Doing this driven development like this, I think is just a waste of time. Except that when you're new, this is typically how you get started. Right? So it's a waste of time from my perspective because I've been doing this for close to 12, 13 years and uh, it's a waste of time from that perspective. Uh, what just happened? Oh, there it is, everyone can see my password. So it's a waste of time from that perspective but it is useful for someone starting and there are a bunch of problems with this. So what I want to do is, I, I think this is what, what we would refer to as a ritualistic test-driven development. This is a very ritualistic way of doing it. You say, well, you need a test. Well, I wrote a test. If the test should fail, it didn't fail, so we made it fail. We go in, intentionally put minus one or whatever, <coughs> fail the test, and then we make the test pass. And then we say, this is great, let's write the next test. Uh, Let's, let's say someone starts like this, and then they say, well, this is no good, right? So, I'm going to delete this. I'm going to delete this. So, this is going to be round two now. So, yeah. So mature. <laughs> we've learned, we've figured out that this is not a very good approach. And now, how would you approach this? How would you make this better? Right? So, let's start with the tests. Actually, just start. And there we go. And um, what would we call this this time? Yeah, we need to think of the domain. Yeah. So, uh, what's the domain that we're dealing with, and and who's the who's the players involved uh, at this point? So maybe uh, IRS, the Indian Revenue Service, is really responsible for the. Yeah, I mean they have the formulas. They decide the formulas for when, who, how much taxes should be applied. So maybe. That's, that's what is the core of the system and we need to focus on that. So let's start with IRS, which is the Indian Revenue System test. So in some sense we should be talking about the domain here then. Right? Yes. I mean, why is that these guys get away without any tax? Why don't they pay any tax? Because, because they are low income groups. Ah. So, I... so what you're saying is low income group does not pay tax, uh, income tax to be precise, they might pay other kinds of taxes. Low income group does not pay income tax. How do I know what is low income group? That's what we're going to define next. So what do we say, assert equals, uh, we say again 10,000. 
and this time we're going to say irs dot calculate take home for the income so we'll pass the income for income or for and then pass ten thousand yeah okay control one create local variable that's irs and what do we do with irs well, we just clarify it at this point, and maybe we we need to pass the whole uh, bunch of rules here because uh, it's going to refer to the rules. So, but, but we don't need to go that be, far. Rules should be encapsulated within it, right? Yes. I mean, that's the point of having an object to encapsulate that business logic. So, I think this is good. As we, oops, this should go in my production code. So maybe as we write more tests, we might feel the need for passing rules, yes. doing other kinds of good practices that we have learned. But for now, this should be good. That's pretty much it. Oh yeah, precision. Precision. And Why is it good? Why is it failing? Oh, because uh, I made a mistake. So I got a failing test, right? Pretty cool technique. And there we go. It's working. Is it slightly better than last time? Do you notice any difference? Little bit of more modeling around the domain, right? Little bit of more thinking in terms of what we expect. And uh, a little bit better than what we had last time, a little bit of thinking about the domain, a little bit of a discussion around the, whether the, the rules should be passed in, rules should be kept out. And also I think uh, if there is a new person joining the team, uh, he or she would be able to read this much closer without any impedance mismatch because business rule is not right, right away there. I mean, it, the business is low income group and, and it just kind of sinks in. So. You know, this to me is a good self, I mean, there's no influence mismatch, so as a developer, I don't have to translate code uh, in my head in, and uh, match it with the domain. Yeah, it's not, it's talking in terms of business rules, not implementation details. Yeah. So this is good, but what we want to do is we want to show uh, another technique, which we think once you do this enough, you feel this is not valuable enough, so I'm going to go ahead and delete this and we're going to do this slightly differently now right so we're going to show you another way of doing test driven development which generally after you've done it a little while then you would evolve into this so i'm just going to say parameterize and here i'm going to pass uh what are we passing so we're going to pass what is the income and then what is the take home take home right so if 10,000 is your income, then what should be your take home? 10,000. Okay. And if your income is 3 lakhs, which is what it is here, then your take home should be 2 lakhs 70,000. 2 lakhs 70,000. If your income is 2 lakhs 70, 7 lakhs 50,000, 7 lakhs 50,000, then you would expect take home of? 6 lakhs and if your income was 20 lakhs then you would take home just 14 lakhs to that okay so that's good enough uh, let's get all of these guys working and then what else do we need to do? Uh, we need to say, well, this runs with parameterize dot class, and we need a constructor. So that's just the scaffolding for but the test. Yeah, I mean, if we use the better framework, maybe we didn't have to do all of this, but you know, it's no big deal. We can get away with this. So let's do double, and this is income, and double take home and just assign it 
and then our actual tax. Income tax calculation. I don't know, maybe better name. Um, maybe, yeah. Well, let's start with that. And then basically we are saying that assert equals uh, your take home basically should be new IRS dot take home calculate or uh, take home as it's calculate income tax for and your income and of course it doesn't understand that we're gonna create this And of course now I simply cannot return income and get away. It's pushing me to take a bigger step. But let's ensure that the test is actually passing to start with. And let's do that. So please on the pass the remaining. So illegal argument type. Uh, why is that? The illegal argument type is in the constructor. Yes, because these guys need to be. Yeah, so maybe we put it uh, as illegal. We can do that. Or just do point zero for all of them. This is all the clutter you have to deal with in Java. But hopefully that should be done. Notice we are making much more bigger steps, but there is an advantage to doing this if you're doing TDD for a while. Yeah, no, we are having a session failure. So, so the first one passes and the rest of them fail. So how would we implement this? Okay, maybe uh, we need to store this slabs in our index. Yeah, so let's get private static final tax labs. So uh, the table and uh, tree map. Okay. And that basically takes a double, consumes a double, and returns a double, and returns a the percentage, right? Yeah. So let's assume the percentages also can be double. Okay. So we basically have the tax labs equals new tree map. Pick this pick, and I'm just going to initialize it in there. Yeah. So, what are our different tax labs? So, so we're saying up to two lakhs. Yeah. Yeah. No tax. So up to two lakhs, the slab is zero. Yeah. Then we are saying two lakhs to five. Yeah. Five lakhs. So five lakhs. 10% and then what else? 10, 5 to 10 is 20 so 10 lakhs 20 yeah. and yeah. last one is greater than double dot so I think the largest one infinity yeah. positive infinity positive infinity is 30% and now what do we need to do? We need to uh, get the get the tax. So basically, let's find the tax lab. Tax lab dot. Uh, we need the income. Is it lower entry? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And pass the income, which will return us the uh, tax lab. I'll give you the tax lab. And then we so will. Talk. Value. Basically, income into one minus the percentage, right? Yeah. So slab uh, dot <coughs> get value. That's the tax. Uh, so that's divided by hundred. Yes, because it's percentage. And I think get value. So this should be. Yeah. Uh, 
Is this TDD? Same problem, a slightly different approach. Right? What the focus? The focus here is on what? Of course, a lot of focus was on Java mechanics, yeah. which we wish we used a better language. Let's put that crap aside. But yeah, yeah, all the nonsense you have to do in Java. But yeah, other than that, what was the focus on? So the focus, in my opinion, was to get the core slabs and the logic for the slabs out. Right? That's that's the core thing. Uh, instead of going one little thing at a time, the advantage of going with this entire thing was that it pushed us automatically in this direction of having a tree map of the slabs. Right? Which otherwise we would have put a else condition, a else condition, and maybe eventually we would have reached that. Right? But this just gets us, because we are writing the test in this particular fashion, it got us straight away thinking in the direction of this tree, you know, tree map, which clearly documents your slabs, this is your slab, this is your tax, this is your slab, this is your tax, right? So I think you're really getting much closer to your domain than, you know, going around and writing test after test, test after test, writing it else, it else, it else, till you, you know, reach that point. So this is, you know, a lot of people who, who will who will be TDD phonetics will look at this and say, this is evil, this is bad, this is too big a step. Right? But in my opinion, it doesn't matter because it's getting you closer to what the value is. The value here is documentation and the second thing is quick feedback. The faster we reach feedback, the better, I mean, the time to get feedback is, I mean, that's the value right there. The way feedback also gets interpreted is you write really small tests and you get feedback very quickly, right? So that's one way to think about feedback. But that feedback is that really useful, right? Or is this feedback more useful? So the quality of feedback is extremely important. So, you know, what we're talking about is you can start with a very ritualistic way, then you get better and you say, okay, you know, this is how I do. Once you're doing that enough, then you say, okay, you know, there is, let's focus on the core. Let's not waste time on just, you know, doing TDD for the sake of doing TDD, right? So we kind of move up to this level. And next I'm going to show you the last level where when you start doing TDD, uh, which is my case, uh, you stop doing TDD. But you apply TDD at a very different level. And a lot of people will not think of that as TDD. But uh, this is what I've been doing with a bunch of my startups and stuff like that. So let's uh, quickly jump to that and we'll have a look at what that level of TDD looks like. Uh, so let me turn off mirroring. Can you get the audio on this? Okay, it is on. Yeah, it's on. Thank you. So I want you to just watch this video and tell me what do you think about applying TDD at this level. So my name is Paul Howe. I'm going to talk about a specific technique that my startup has used to conduct really realistic, really effective user tests of, of our ideas. So about a year ago, we had an idea for a social purchase sharing app where you would stream out what you're buying to your friends and they would share back with you what they were buying and it was going to be great and it was going to be a, a social networking take on product reviews. 
And being a lean startup, we mocked it up, static prototypes, we got it in front of a lot of people, and, and they said, you know, I'm not going to use it, but I could see a lot of people might use it. And then we heard that again and again, and we said, well, well, why wouldn't you use it? And they said, because I don't know which of my friends would actually use this. And it made sense. It's a social application, and if they don't see the real faces of their friends that they can emotionally connect with, they can't actually grok what it's going to be about. So I said, all right, we need to, to make this a more realistic test than what we've done. And we drill down on the most important interaction on the site, which is when someone does a purchase and shares it on Facebook, and it appears in, in their friend's newsfeed. And we're interested, would people actually click? Would they care? So we thought about, uh, you know, how can we make this realistic? Do we have to build the whole thing, and build this pretty serious-sized app to do this, or can we fake it really well? And we decided to try to fake it, and the technique we used was a Grease Monkey script. So, if you're not familiar with Grease Monkey, it's just a simple little JavaScript that can change the way a website appears. So, so here's an Amazon product page. After I install Grease Monkey, it now pops up every time I go there, a little yellow box that shows competitors' prices. So, um, it's specific to one page and, and it alters that page. So, I went on rentacoder.com, described what I wanted, and I found a guy in the Philippines who was willing to build our script for $40. We sent our $40 across the ocean. And a few days later, sure enough, back came the script. And it's pretty simple. There's the whole thing right there. You just drag that into Chrome or to Firefox, and it wakes up every time it gets on its target page. So every time we went to Facebook, it would wake up and it would run itself. So the next thing we do, is our standard procedure. We post an ad on Craigslist, say we're running a social media focus group. We bring people in, say, what's your favorite social media site? And invariably they'd say Facebook. It's a great bunch of log into Facebook. That's a great idea. And up would pop their newsfeed, and they're feeling totally in control. It seems very realistic. The newsfeed pops up, and the Grease Monkey script runs, and it inserts fake content into their feed. And it's using their real friends' names and faces. So it's pixel perfect real. If we built the whole thing, it wouldn't look any different than that. And so then we sat back and said, well, are they going to notice this content that our app would normally insert into their feed? And sure enough, no prompting, they were like, wait a minute, my friend Michelle bought a Lady Gaga album, and my friend Charlie got you know, an iPad, and they noticed, and they reacted very strongly. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> this, is how, this is how Facebook is going to hell. It used to be about friends, and now it's about commercial stuff. Uh, I remember back in the day, we would share poetry, and now I hate these ads. Uh, and we did it 50 times, and there were three people who liked it. So it was a very different reaction than when we did the initial prototypes. And it really wasn't that hard to do. Uh, you know, it was a $40 script. So that's my main point. It, you know, don't think that you just have to do the paper. You, you, you can do something better. Uh, so, all right, uh, you can watch the rest of the video at leisure. But did you notice him using specific words in his presentation? He talked about tests. We ran these tests. We got a social media group and we ran these tests. And he got the script for forty dollars. And he, you know, essentially tested. What did he test? Not whether the script worked. Idea. The idea. The concept. Tested the idea. Tested the hypothesis. To be clear, he tested the hypothesis that you know this is my hypothesis. Will people really care? Does this hypothesis work? So that's TDD at a very different level, right? So you have a hypothesis. Typically, when you're doing test driven development, when you write the test name, you're writing your hypothesis, and then you basically go write your test and run the test. It should fail, and then you you know write just enough code to make it work. In this case, they had a hypothesis. And they basically ran their tests by outsourcing the script or whatever it takes to do. And then they basically saw if people would really care or you know, way to validate the hypothesis. So in my opinion, you don't have to you know, stick to doing the usual TDD that people talk about. You can apply TDD at very different levels. Right? I wrote an article for InfoQ where I talked about sell it before you build it. Right? That's again using the test driven development mindset that you, know, you can basically try and validate what you're building before you go ahead and go you know, write all your fancy tests and all of that stuff and build it. You know, these days I don't even write tests because I'm doing tests at a much different level. So it depends on your context, it depends on where you are in your evolution. 
but you don't have to stick to the very ritualistic way of doing things. You can see what works best for you. So why don't we talk a little bit about these terminologies that we've been using? Yeah, sure. So you've seen this in action. So we've been using the word rituals. So as the dictionary defines, I mean, it's a, it's a prescriptive uh, series of steps that you apply, right? And that's what a starter does, really, you know, uh, just, just follows the laid down steps. Um, practice, whereas, is uh, the actual application of the belief. So that's the delineation between practice versus ritual. Um, so, our thing is here that, you know what, rituals, the, the benefit of the rituals is, is in the training that they give. But, it's, it's like, I would like to switch over and say, uh, I would like to use this example. When we were learning to bicycle, right, we used to have those two wheels on the side, just help us balance. But those same very wheels, when we want to speed up or take a sharp turn, would cause you to fall. So we have to kind of develop that sense or that eye that these rituals are going to help me till this point, but beyond this, it's not. So, uh, hence, you know, we have to discern when rituals are a helper and rituals are a bar. Right? Our goal is to launch ourselves from ritual to practice. Uh, further, as we go through this journey, we really want to make sure that you know, we discover the principles which underlie, underpin the pr practices. As we go pr progress from that stage, we launch ourselves from practices uh, to principles, principles to values, sorry, And ultimately, we need to discover the values which underpin the practices as well. So that's an ongoing journey. As we go more and more, as we go, become more and more adept at doing things, this is what we eventually want to land up with, uh, is values. Yeah. So my question here is then, does it mean that being agile is, is following these uh, TDD practice or refactoring iterations, future factors, retrospectives. Well, is, is this, is your version of Agile a practice or a ritual? Same thing with stand-ups. Do you come every day morning into your stand-ups and just ask these three questions? Is your stand-up a practice or a ritual? Well, this is a workshop. We have talked for 30 minutes and bored people to death. Uh, so let's convert it into actually a workshop. So what I want is I want seven volunteers. Seven brave volunteers. Please come up. We're going to try and do a quick stand-up and we're going to see how we can move from one level of stand-up to another level of stand-up to another level of stand-up. Those who come on stage really get to learn. Those who don't get to watch. So I need seven volunteers real quick, please. Awesome, this group is very energetic. That's okay. What did you what do you plan to eat tonight? And any obstacles. Right? And I want the rest of you to watch their body language and see how they go about doing this. Right? So why don't you form a group? Who's going to play the scrum master role? The guy with the mic is volunteered to be the scrum master, right? <laughs> Alright, so why don't you guys get started and we'll see the rest of them will see how they stand up goes. Well, they're doing a stand-up, so they have to be in a circle. Yeah. 
That's okay. You can see the body language from the back as well. <laughs> All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. So let's start a stand up. And uh, we just want to know what you ate yesterday night, what you're planning to eat tonight. Are there any problems you're having with the food that you ate yesterday night? Or, you know, any other problems with getting food tonight? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a sandwich of sauce for dinner last night. Uh, I'm planning to eat uh, rich biryani today, uh, tonight. Uh, no roadblocks yet. I had a pilau last night. Uh, I'm planning to eat what it is feed me tonight. And it's just a time in between this and this. Uh, it was a light dinner, I think. It's going to be a light dinner today. I don't see any good plots with light in it. I had a chapati and a vegetable uh, last night. Uh, I'm planning to eat whatever the conference has to offer. Uh, the roadblock that I have is that I don't know the menu yet, so I'm not able to decide what I would be planning to eat tonight. not decided yet, like I have to either get a takeaway or maybe eat, go somewhere, so not decided yet. I ate vegetable and some salad yesterday along with chapati and today I'll be having a dinner over here and as she said I don't know what, what it will be but the main roadblock is recently I'm eating a lot of oily food and it's really affecting my health. So whatever it is, I'm going to eat less. Hello. Yeah, my name is Ajit. So today I had uh, Chinese last night. So today I would like to eat something really healthy. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll actually uh, be eating dinner tonight uh, as diet because I would like to just go home and eat something healthy. Yesterday I had uh, Gujarati food named Hango. Today I intend to eat some Maharashtri. The only impediment I see is uh, what the conference has to offer. So I'm not sure that I'll be able to get what I'm intending to eat. Yesterday I, the bus stopped at some point and I had a thali over there. And uh, I don't plan like what I will eat today, whatever I will see, whatever happens. And any roadblocks, none. All right, thanks a lot. So. Uh, Maybe I can arrange for uh, the menu of the conference and maybe that will help some of you. Uh, I, I think we need to sit together for something like opposite stand up for, uh, to discuss the harmful effects of quality food, too much of quality food. And uh, I, I can see if we can arrange for a cook for you tonight. So thanks a lot. All right, very good scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> so please wait here. Let's, let's see, what, what did you guys see? Uh, what was the body language that you guys saw? Anyone wants to chip in? Yes, please. Stand up, you need a little bit of pre work before coming to the stand ups. So, I saw some people are thinking right away there, you know, what was they did yesterday, what they're going to do day to day, and what are the obstacles. They need a little bit of pre work before coming to the stand ups. So, you saw people not having done the homework to before the stand up, okay? Yeah. <coughs> so, I, I noticed people making eye contacts with me. Basically, with the Scrum Master, that's, that's not correct. Basically, because you are based off of the team, not of the Scrum Master. That should be avoided. Why? If you have, if you're talking and you are looking at the Scrum Master, it seems that you're giving updates. Uh, and the Scrum Master is like a project manager who is looking for the updates. But if not, uh, the stand-up is meant for the entire team. So the eye contact should be with everyone, so that you are just sharing whatever you, you did with everyone, and not just with the Scrum Master. Okay, that's a very good point. Yeah, please pass it along. Sometimes it's not easy, easy to share the roadblocks. We really need to take the courage and share that. So, did you guys face that challenge now? Not now, but in no, general. In general, in general, general yes. like I, uh, I would prefer for us to just hide the roadblock and unless it gets a big problem. Right, so you can have a discussion with this grandmaster later. <laughs> Let's pass it over there. 
I noticed that some were very hesitant sharing. I mean, in sense that it was not it was not so spontaneous or fearless when you were sharing. Uh, the idea that you're sharing it with a team that that's your team should actually the mental stance should be it doesn't matter what I say really. It's it's about sharing and it's about getting the problems or issues resolved or the roadblocks removed. So even a request for the menu has to be more assertive. I feel sometimes because. You are asking and you have a right to ask, so the hesitancy kind of, and probably that's personality as well, so I, that's an observation. There's just 15 minutes old team, so yeah, I, I, still I, trying I, to figure that, it out. But yeah. I mean more in the general principle of the team. Yeah, yeah, sure. Cool. So, uh, does, do you guys all remember who said what? Who ate what? Chinese. So my question is, does everyone remember who said what? It's a big team. Uh, how many people are you? Four, four, eight, nine. New big team. <laughs> so it's a little hard to remember who said what, right? Uh, I saw the Scrum Master offered some help, but what about others? Just give my status and move to the next, right? I'm done, so I don't have to worry. But the person who's waiting next, oh my turn, what am I saying? Oh, 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 oh. Should I tell this? Should I not? <laughs> right? Have you seen that in, in real life? Yeah. Where people are very focused on what they have to say and, you know, once their turn is over, they're like, ah. Oh. <sighs> right? Relax, lose muscles. <laughs> Easy, someone else is turned now. So let's try and uh, do this again, right? Uh, I'll, I'll keep you guys sane. Let's try and do this again. And here, what we want to do as we're putting up over there is we want to see a genuine interest, right? We want to see a genuine interest in planning, you know, what we can do and how to offer help, right? So we'll focus on you know, a genuine, you know, uh, genuine effort to understand who's saying what and what they need and what challenges they're facing and also a genuine effort to help them. Right, so can we do this again quickly to see you know, if that would make any difference? We'll keep the same format. Some of those questions are optional. So if you, if you don't have any roadblocks, don't waste everyone's time. Right? Uh, if, if you didn't need anything, just say pass and <laughs> move on. Uh, so not all questions are compulsory. The goal is, what is our goal? Is to be able to help and be genuinely interested in what others are doing. Okay. So let's do take two, quickly. All right. Hello, everyone. So we are going to talk about food. So uh, I ordered uh, two uh, packets of biryani tonight. Uh, so if anybody wants, uh, I, I'm just going to eat one. If anybody needs a second packet, feel free to borrow it from me. I had plow and I'm up for the surprise. Anyone who is you know, up for the surprises, we can talk together and do it. Uh, one of my friends was supposed to join me. Uh, he, he, he just sent me a message saying he's not joining me, but I've already ordered. So if anybody needs a packet of biryani, I have it. Uh, nice, nice biryani. So if anybody needs it, just let me know. If it's a veg biryani, I would prefer it. Yeah. It's not veg. A veg biryani. I would like to have a biryani. If anybody else is planning, we can order together. I was planning to go out, but now since you are ordering, I can join you. Yeah, so I, I said I would like to have uh, something healthy tonight. I think biryani definitely is not my choice. But if, uh, if anyone is interested in eating some healthy food, maybe, yeah, we could just go together. Probably I can ask my wife to prepare an extra dish. Since there are multiple people trying to take the same kind of video, I'm going to spare my mind. Okay, good, good idea. So I, I would like to go out for having a mastery, rather than depending on the conference <laughs> panel. <laughs> Yeah, 
No, that thing is, I think everyone has found some partner, so I'll find out for myself then. <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> More self-organizing teams. <laughs> so, what did you guys notice this time? It's not Scrum. It's not Scrum. <laughs> Collaboration. I think participation. The most folks pass it up. So, I think uh, participation is one thing. The other thing is, you know, we... Again, it's a kind of tool. But it's like a progress reporting kind of thing. So, when we are actually doing the progress, whatever the progress you are doing, you know, I think we have to complete the entire decision first, and then indulge in um, doing a, you know, individual discussions. When you are finding over here is we have not completed the progress till the end, and then we started the conversation in between. Sometimes this, this is just nice with the discussions. When you actually jump on, you know, when a couple of people started discussing, when others are, you know, Okay, that's interesting. I want to come back to that. Uh, can you pass the mic back there, please, and then we'll come to you. On the positive side, I think they were genuinely happy in each other. There was a genuine interest to help them, and they were quite relaxed. Well. Quite relaxed than previous time. Okay, that's an interesting observation. Uh, we have a gentleman over here. For the first round, it seemed like more of a group of energy. In the second round, it was a little steep. Okay, so is it fair to make the jump and say there was a little bit of bonding, a little bit of better experience this time than the first time? In response to his uh, question that it was uh, that we forgot the progress uh, reporting thing, so I would say that progress can be seen in the form of Jira tickets or whatever way we are uh, we uh, record our progress. So that should not be the actual point of standard. That's how I believe that uh, you can see that progress on your board, like who is doing what. If there were any roadblocks, that should be uh, put up in the standard rather than just stating what is obviously there in the board. Our focus was to go things moving rather than how they are being done. Very good point, right? Very good point. Did you have something? Okay. Yeah, please. Actually, I think because I think the goal was. It's, 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 I think the goal was uh, what I would like to accomplish today, not then just giving updates. I think that was an important part. I think when she's. Like, yeah. So I'm quite happy because this is the direction I wanted this to go. So it's falling in place. <laughs> right? uh, we we have one more little thing before you guys run off, right? Uh, so let's do uh, take three, and I promise this is the last one. Uh, and in take three, we want to step back a little bit, and we want to look at, you know, we're all talking about having dinner, we're all focused on what we want to eat, and then we move to, okay, as a group, what do we want to do? And now we're saying, oh, let's, let's put a goal, right? Let's say our goal today is that we have some guests and we'll work as a team to feed them, right? It's a slight bit making a jump. And basically, you know, drop the three questions. Right? Drop the three questions. Focus on what is your game plan for today. How are you going to achieve the goal that is basically you have guests for dinner. Right? And you as a group are going to feed the guests. Right? So that's the plan and we're going to see uh, more collaborative effort in terms of achieving the thing. Right? So here you go. Alright, so the scenario for tonight is that we have some guests coming in. Uh, we know their preferences, but basically we have been given the responsibility to, you know, have something for them for the dinner tonight. I'm sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Let's drop the Scrum Master role. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, so you're now part of the team. You're not a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we have five guests coming in. Uh, uh, yeah, are the kids coming? Which John or which? Both people who, uh, who, who have preference for which as a John or which? But I think I can uh, cook. So, uh, do we have any particular cuisine preferences? He's not a scrum master, remember? Okay. Uh, so we should uh, 
also see if we want to arrange for salads because uh, normally uh, people prefer salads and fresh ones. So I am stepping outside and I can get uh, fresh vegetables for salad preparation. So we should know if we have uh, international uh, uh, guests because they definitely would prefer something less spicy. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, are the guests going to come to eat? Are they going? They going? That's to eat, right? Sure. We want to decide the menu quickly, like what starter and what main course and what dessert, and accordingly we get into action. Okay, so, so you said you're getting the salads, right? Okay, and he's going to bring some cooked food from home. You're, you're going to cook. What, what, what are you going to cook? Okay. Okay, so, so, so what are you going to bring? Like, let's decide on the menu first. But I know you two items to so I cannot tell you that this is over the menu. What do you do? So, who's right on this question? I also need to have a, you know, kind of mixed cuisine. Video. All right, good. That's good, right? Uh, so, what did you guys think about this so far? There were too many questions, but too few answers. And On the side note, I also thought that uh, coming up with a plan for something that's uh, going to happen was, shouldn't really be the agenda for a stand-up, but uh, I don't know, that's going to ask. Okay, so should this be part of, uh, part of the stand-up or should this be done outside, right? I mean, this is just an example, of course, the kind of building on the example that we had, but are there specific restrictions around what gets discussed in the stand-up or not? Right. We'll go there. We, uh, we could have time boxed our discussion. Uh, that would have been more uh, valuable. So time boxing would probably help. We had someone over there. should be the team, but that's the team, right? I mean, the team is deciding that this is what we're going to do. People are offering what they can do. Some are saying, hey, I can do this. Some are saying, I can't cook, but I can go out and get stuff. So they're offering what they can do. They're bringing their expertise to the table. And as a group, they need to decide now how they're going to collaborate to get this thing done, right? And maybe there are better ways to do this in terms of make it more effective. Yes. But I think the good thing I see is people are offering what they can bring to the table instead of just waiting for someone to be told or things like that because that's very hard to know who can do what and there's a lot of volunteerism right that's one very good element that you see you had a point oh, sir. see the thing is that if you look at uh, the scrum practices there's a very uh, there's a specific reason why stand up is done the way it is done and the three questions are asked the activity that, see the first stand up that you showed obviously was very dry and dry the team spirit was coming in I believe the second one was the right one. The third one, basically, this is an activity the team does after the meeting. So the collaboration part and everything, the team is doing this the entire day in the sprint. So they need not necessarily do that as a part of the stand-up. That, that is something that they do always after the stand-up. So I believe that the exercise number two was something that looked okay. 
three is taken to the extreme and one was a very dry. Okay, good point. I just felt a bit different about this. I, I just got a feeling that whether this is the way Scrum should be. It's like all together needs to achieve one small story, one small feature. What all we can do together for that day to achieve that goal so that we, tomorrow we are done with that. So, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. Is it that instead of the typical rituals that what I am going to do to meet that team goal, it's all the thing like we all together have one team goal to have that event and what all we individually can do and solve problems to achieve that goal. Okay, so, so I'm saying that this is the strong ritual, it is another end of living it and practicing it. So I don't know. I mean, th this is this is I don't, I can't speak for them, right? I can speak for my own experience. Rahul can speak for his own experience. But uh, what we feel, we see way too many teams uh, stuck at rituals and saying Scrum says this, so we're going to do this. And we visit them after two years, and they're still doing the same thing. We visit them after three years, they're still doing the same thing. And I think they set this, they they cornered themselves into certain rituals or certain practices, and they believe that's best. They're not questioning it, they're not seeing if there's any true value, right? Teams where I work, I mean, you guys can sit down. Thank you. Big round of applause for them. <laughs> Teams where I work, we uh, essentially start with the ritualistic way of doing it. We get people to answer the three questions because they're not used to doing it. And this is the first way to break their ice and get them to at least speak and share. It doesn't happen the really the way you want, but it's good. It's a, it's a starting point. It's like the, you know, what Gavan was talking about. It's, it's like the training wheels that you have in the cycle. You know, do you want to drive all your life around with training wheels? Obviously not, right? So you progress and gradually you keep progressing through this. And what I've seen is mostly, at least on all the teams I've worked, we stop doing stand-ups because it doesn't really add much value. We've internalized certain things. And if you look at the fourth level, basically we do, you know, just-in-time hurdles. Whenever we have a roadblock, instead of waiting till the next stand-up, we pull up people together and we do a quick, you know, hurdle. And it might also be, you know, in this specific case, you're cooking and then, you know, say you run out of sugar or something. Then you quickly pull, pull a hurdle to the start and then you move on. You're not going to wait till the next morning to say, hey, I was stuck with this roadblock, so I didn't do anything, right? That's not, that's not going to help. Uh, also, a lot of times, you know, people find interesting ways of doing the collaboration. What is the purpose of the stand-up? I think, you know, that's very important to understand. What is the objective? What is the purpose of the stand-up? Is the purpose of the stand-up, like someone brought up earlier, uh, you know, you can, you can go to Jira or whatever project management tool you're using and you could see what the progress is. Uh, I don't quite think the purpose of the stand-up is to talk about the progress. Uh, you know, in fact, if you see the stand-up, the practice, actually, where does it come from? I mean, it comes from Scrum, it comes from Extreme Programming, both of them had this practice, but where did they get the inspiration from? From the game. American football. American football. When they get together and decide the strategy. Most uh, games, if you see, most games, people hurdle, the players hurdle around every now and then and they kind of talk about what, is, what will be the game plan, right? How would, they, how would they, given that we are here and it's a dynamic game, it's constantly changing, given that we are here, how are we going to meet our goal? How are we going to win? How are we going to do what we want to do? And they do hurdles at different points in time and that was, you know, the, that is the example that they took and they said, okay, we also as software team are going to do on a daily basis this. Right? And I, I feel somewhere we've kind of forgotten the game planning part of it and we've kind of stuck with the ritual where we just think about answering the four questions and we think of three questions and we think, you know, that is stand up. So something to think about. I mean, what is the goal? What is the value you get out of a stand up? Is it status? Is it true collaboration? Right? Is it the teamwork building that? What is that we want out of it? And then you have to decide depending on your maturity of your team, what will suit your needs. Right? It's not one pan fits all. Right? It has to be what works for your team. Let's look at quickly an example of stories. Right? How many people have seen stories like this? Yeah? Uh, that's a real example, by the way. <laughs> right? I, didn't, I didn't cook it up. We didn't cook it up. It is a real example. It's not a good story. 
Why is it not a good story? Let's talk about that. It talks about creating database table. It doesn't talk anything from the user perspective. The, the overall level. Well, the question is the user is a developer, right? <laughs> so, from a developer's point of view, that absolutely makes sense. And I think if you are coming from a six-year planning cycle to something like this, it's a good first step. Right? If you're coming from a six-year planning cycle kind of an environment, this is a good first step. I mean, we can laugh at it because, you know, we've, we've kind of gone past that. But, you know, once upon a time in our career, that seemed like, wow, I mean, that's unique. I, why would you do that? Right? That's not how we do software development. Uh, so when you're starting off, maybe that's good, but you know the, the, the practice that a lot of people will talk about is something of this sort. You will see a story of this sort, right? As an account agent, I want to create an invoice so that my company can request payments from customer. Is this a good story? From all the brainwashing we've got all these years, yes, that seems like a good story. Right? This is kind of putting the stories in practice the way we want it to, right? Not a story for design, a story for code, a story for tests. Uh, we're trying more vertical stories that slice across, right? Let's look at, if you're doing this already, should you just stop here? Is there something better? Can you do, can you evolve from here to doing something better? What would that be? How many people do story mapping over here? A few people, right? So when you do the story mapping, this is an example from one of the projects that I worked on, where we have Bob, who's an expert, who's explaining how basically, you know, certain users work in the environment, and he's kind of defining a day in life of what the users would look like. And then we put that day in life of Ed, who's our user, then we try to map it into what are the activities that you know, Ed would do, and then to achieve those activities, what were the tasks he would perform, uh, right? And we start mapping this out in this kind of a two-dimensional space where we talk about activities on the top as time passes by and necessity on the, this axis as time passes by, as, uh, you know, from a most necessary to the least necessary thing. You notice here the team is kind of putting this together, trying to work on this, and the team is completely engaged. Everyone's arguing about what is this, how it should, uh, you know, why is this important? Should it be really, you know, up there? Should we pull it down? You know, is there any dependency of this on something else? Without this, we'll be able to achieve that. Because now they're looking at this in two-dimensional space. They see, okay, here I'm going to be providing some service, and to be able to provide this service. I need some data. Where is that data coming from? I need some instruments which is going to collect the data. Who's thought about that? You know, have we have we got that? So you basically what typically a product owner would do or a product manager would do in their head. You're kind of putting it out there so everyone can jump on it and they can give. Uh, everyone can add their perspective into it. And at this point, we don't even write stories anymore. Is we just take that, put it up, we know who the user is, what the goal of the user is, and then how we slice the problem into multiple levels of priority, and what is the most important thing that we need as you cut across the entire thing, right? And that becomes your first iteration, first release, first milestone, whatever you want to call it, right? And then people just focus on that. You don't see stories as, as a, I want to, so that anymore. Is this better? Yes. I don't know. It depends on where in the evolution the team is. Right? Can we skip certain steps? Probably. Right? Do we need to write stories like the first way? Probably you could skip that. But in some cases that might be necessary. Right? Some, sometimes you need to crawl before you start running. So it really depends on the maturity of the team, the complexity of the problem that you're solving, and a lot of different parameters. But what we're talking about is kind of a really true uh, you know, evolution of these practices as we have seen, going from ritio to focusing on the practice to here focusing on the principle. What is the principle? Why do we write stories? What is the purpose of stories? Conversation starter. It's a placeholder for conversation. Right? Ron Jeffries said a story should have three C's. What are the three C's? The card, 
the conversation and the confirmation. Right? So it is about, it's a placeholder for conversation. It's not, it's not a big document that has everything detailed out. Right? So if that's your focus, if your focus is to explain the problem domain, to help people understand what is the problem that you're solving from the user's perspective, right? You need to find ways of expressing that. And you want, the reason we write stories is you want everyone to work together, collaborate together, instead of writing these big documents and tossing it over the wall, right? So think about ways in which you can improve. Can we stop here? Are we done? There are ways of improving it, right? And you're sure about that, which is good, <laughs> because we have one more stage to go. <laughs> so we talk about customer development and product discovery, right? So you guys must have heard about Lean Startup, right? There's a bunch of stuff happening in the Lean Startup community. So this, what we talked about, story mapping and all of that work that Jeff Patton and other people did, I think is pretty cool. But when you look at product discovery, customer development, they have some very interesting ideas that we can take and further simplify what we are doing. Here's an example of uh, a company which wanted to build a service which will basically suggest what book you should read. So you go in and you give given basic information and it gets you started on what is the book that they think you should read. And they have pretty good analytics that they can build which will figure out what book you should read. So you go in, you enter a couple of details and then it presents something like this. Right, and if you can't find, and, I mean if you notice here, uh, there are a bunch of criteria that it says it used to determine which books you should be reading and things like that. And we say, well, that's great, right? Let's find a paying customer. So you take this and you walk across in your own organization. Right? You get people to actually, you know, you play the computer role, you hold these screens and you get someone to actually use it. And you validate whether people will use this and whether they will pay anything for this or not. Whether, you know, what feedback they have. So you're going very quickly and once you have these, you know, flushed out, you probably don't need to write stories anymore. You iterate on it, you figure out, you work as a group, and you've got something working, and you think people like it, you've validated that, you've get, you, you validated your business case, and then you can take this and put it in your team, your developers, your testers, the entire team has been part of this, and now they don't need any more ceremonies of writing the stories or doing other things, you just stick them on the wall, and people go after it and build the thing. Right, so you've tightened your feedback cycle, You've done your UX, right? And you've also got everyone on the same page. And as you start working through this, things will change. This is not, nothing remains static. But because it's low fidelity, it welcomes people to change it. Right, so that's basically, uh, you know, how stories, the practice of stories itself has evolved over the time. Can we start directly at this level? I don't know. Probably not. You know, people need to get some basics before they can jump straight here. Right? They need to understand how to break things down. They need to understand how to slice things. They need to understand some other things. But once they get that, don't be stuck with it. Right? Try and evolve. Try and push the boundaries. Question things. Right? Ask what is the real value we are getting? And is, is there things we can optimize to really get the value? We have how much time left? I think we have 15 minutes left. We cannot quickly, we can uh, jump into the retrospectives and quickly talk about that. Linda did a session in the morning, yeah. so we can just build on top of it. Go ahead. So yeah, what about the retrospectives, right? We all were there. Uh, certainly, these, it's not these questions. So question that as well, whether it's a practice or a ritual. We talk about retrospectives. We the tables, we come, you know, this is no value at all, right? Like how many people you will see continuing doing this months and years and years still, right? And no action items, nothing coming out of it, not going back into your next sprint planning, next iteration planning. And you simply do this because you have to check it off your list, right? 
It, it doesn't help. I mean, we all understand that. Right? Then teams say, well, we can do better than that. Right? There are different formats, there are different styles they can use, a lot of different things you can do. But now they're focusing on what? Like, why would I change from the two column format to something different? More informative, you want people to think. Right? Instead of just two things, you, you put more things out there and hopefully people will think, oh, what should I stop doing? What should we you know, start doing? Maybe that will help, we don't know, but you know, it's worth running a small experiment and seeing. Again, the point of retrospectives is feedback. Right? So you, whatever format will help you get that feedback, whatever format that will help people getting the inspect and adapt philosophy. A lot of times we see that teams stop doing that and move to what we call as the root cause analysis. So here you could be doing all of this and you could be taking some action items and then trying to you know, cover those action items. But are you really fixing the problem for, for good? Right? Are you really mistake-proofing this for future? Because one of the purpose of the retrospective is you want to stop something from happening in the future. And as Linda said in today's workshop, we collect data, but how many of us generate insights out of data? So a lot of people will move to this and say, well, let's focus on being data-driven. Let's get the data and let's do root cause analysis. Let's just not talk at an emotional level and just do retrospectives one after another and you see the same points coming over and over again. Or you see the same thing, you know, basically repeating, you fix one problem, similar problem shows up somewhere else. And so you know, I essentially fixed the root cause of it. So, you know, and here also a lot of uh, teams will say, well, you should not involve uh, you know, stakeholders. Stand-ups or retrospectives are only for the team. The team should see, feel safe doing this. Well, if the stakeholder is the real problem, you could do all the retrospective in the world you want, right? but the problem is somewhere else. So involve them, make them a part of this, and see you know, if they actually can empathize, they can see from your point of view. Right? How else would they see, unless you involve them, you become data-driven and you make it a part of the entire thing. So you could do all of this, and I think this works well, but I've seen a lot of teams where we move to zips, Retrospectives. So we don't do retrospectives sprint after sprint. We do retrospective whenever we find something. Uh, it's more of an event driven, right? When an event occurs, you pull everyone together, say, okay, what was the root cause of that? How do we avoid this from happening again? What can we do? And then let's take corrective action instead of waiting till the end of this iteration of the sprint. And let's just fix that and move on. Let's do micro retros. Right? Not batch everything together. Right? Let's, let's do really small micro batch things which are more event driven. When something occurs, let's do something about it. That's exactly what Linda was mentioning ahead uh, in the first half, continuous retrospectives. So that's what this is. Yeah, and see, again, teams evolve and they see, okay, we can do better than this, we can do better than this. That, that's only happening if they're going to apply at a meta level the retrospectives to their process itself. That you need to ask what is working well, what can we do away with, right? Don't be afraid to throw out practices. It's very important to throw out practices. If you take too many practices, you will, all you'll be doing is process, right? So what I'll ask you to do now is kind of just step back for a minute. We've shown you all these four practices at various levels uh, of maturity. So, uh, find out for yourself where your team is and where you need to go from there. So we need to kind of inspect, adapt, and evolve all the time. Be fearless in jettisoning what doesn't work because you know, that's what you really need to do. That's the need of the time. And if you, uh, you know, try, try, try out different things, small experiments one after the other, and, and you, you should be able to see some progress. Also, question and dispel gospels. That's one of the things that we probably should do, right? If we have to evolve. And if you don't evolve, only two things really happen, which I have seen in my experience. 
Either you get stuck and be fanatic to, uh, for your ideas and you remain there, or you become indifferent. It's going on, it goes on, who cares, right? And, but somewhere deep down, you're really walking with all that baggage all around, right? And in such a, such a situation, it's really hard to get the results. You will, you will find results coming out. Pretty much like the <laughs> background there. Again, the real world is really messy. This is not a straight path, it's not linear. We have to go around this way, maybe two steps forward, one step backward, so on and so forth, right? But at the end of the day, we must ensure that this is really happening, progressing upon progress. I think I would like to emphasize this. We are moving from one progression to another, right? So that's, that's the real value, right? Uh, so if I question all this back, right, and I say, what, what are the values? What, what are the values that you've seen? Would, would these values, uh, you know, come by, uh, you know, preaching, explaining? I don't think so. They, they have to be experientially, uh, uh, they have to be experienced, right? And this, this particular thing, rather, uh, it's neither accepted nor rejected. You know, I, I neither accept it, it's just imbibed. And it is this implicit uh, permeation that kind of goes along. And our, our job, whether you're a scrum master or whether you're an agile coach or whatever, even if you're a team member, one has to, you know, be it from within that, right? And to be from within that, you yourself must first have those values. And in, and, and in real life, they are your inner dispositions. What really values are? They are your inner dispositions. Secondly, let's, let's as, I, as I spoke about, values cannot be explained. And that is why, if they are explained, what happens is they are just in the upper level of the mind. And that gives rise to duplicity, pretension, and hypocrisy. We, if, if I have to teach something to my three-year-old kid, I can't teach. I have to play with her, I have to, I have to be with her, you know, and slowly she will start imbibing. Say for example, let's say two, two of the people are pairing here, right? And each of us has a different value stack, which I've colored it differently here. The priorities of the values are different. But what happens is, when you're having an argument over certain things, when you're pairing, right? You start realizing, hey, you know what? This person's value stack is a bit different, but I understand where he or she comes from. This very thing generates respect. You start seeing things from others' perspective, and they start seeing things from your perspective, right? So, at some point, what would happen is values would permeate. This is this is what really I've observed, and so uh, you know, just just showing, uh, telling, and you know, showing things just doesn't work and work. It's just a level of talks and discussions. Uh, show me and I remember. That's demos and skill casts. And involve me and I learn. That's where you come to workshops like these, or you know, you one has to involve people all the time. It's not just going to work out otherwise. Yeah? I would like you to ask a question. Are you really aware of your own values? <clears throat> just take, in less than a minute, before your mind tries to manipulate your response, try to ask this question, you know? I'll just flash out a few examples here. You know, we interact with a lot of people uh, and, 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 you know, somebody genuinely comes and says, you know what, I've made a mistake, I know, uh, but now I can work on it. The other, other person is, you know, wants to share, hey, let me show what I found you after I worked, we worked on that stuff yesterday. Very enthusiastic, very positive. Their values are being exhibited in their conduct and behavior. And it comes from deep within. It cannot be made up. So, 
What do you deeply see in you? you know? I don't want to know what your values are. You can take out a piece of paper and write it down, but you know, try to ask this question. Because for us, this has been a personal journey in some sense. Right? I would like to ask this question. What can lead to authentic self-realization? What is it? Is it acting with passion? Is it expressing feelings, expressing thoughts and ideas? Well, to answer that question, I would like to say, you know, who am I? Who are you? Right? Well, we just, we just say, well, I'm, uh, let's say I'll just become you right here. Yeah. What's your name, sir? Sorry. Amit Kumar. What is Amit? Amit is just a label applied to, in, uh, to this frame, right? Beyond that, what is it? What is Amit? Is he a physical body? Beyond that, let's dig a little deeper. What is Amit? A bundle of emotions? Let's step back further. Is he the thought? No. Because if you notice, whenever, wh why am I saying it's not a bundle of emotions? Because remember, whenever we get angry, we say what? I am angry. But when anger passes out, we say I was angry or I was consumed by anger. That means you are separate and anger is separate. And at the same time, you can control your feelings. If I, if I go back further, you know, some thoughts, some, some days, you know, some thoughts bother me. You know, I said, I just want to get rid of it and go on to a different track. So you start thinking something different, right? Now, you started playing with your thoughts. The very fact that you can control your thoughts means you can step back. There's something deeper still. It is that place that one has to find. And that's, that's the level from which you'll get authentic self-awareness because it is beyond self-expression. Right? So, again, if I ask this question, what can lead to authentic self-realization? It is the ideals that are in harmony with higher nature of human being. And what are ideals? Ideals are nothing but just set of values. And there are some universal ideas. So I would like to give you an example here. When at work or anywhere where you see a person, you know, uh, acting with integrity and uh, truthfulness in thought, feeling, and action, then mind you, that person is exhibiting the ideal of truth in it. Again, I'm not saying that he's 100%, he or she is 100% right. There's going to be variations of the, the levels at which people exhibit truth would be. Nobody's going to be full 100%, right? Secondly, uh, let's look at uh, uh, transparency, right? In our retrospectives, or while making estimations, if at all you do that, do you see that in your in your own behavior, or you pad estimates? Are you are you truthfully giving somebody a, a, a team? A feedback in terms of retrospectives, really, are you? Cleanliness. We talk about cleanliness. Well, there, cleanliness is at various levels. Physical level, of course, yes. Your desk would be clean or your desktop probably is clean. What about if you are developers in the room? What about your code? Is it clean? levels are we exhibiting this values? Are we, are we at all levels there? 
Likewise, there, is, there, is, there are various universal ideals, teamwork, shared vision, mutual trust, that's fraternity. What about tend towards greater sharing of wealth, power, and knowledge, flattening of hierarchies? Right? So there are a bunch and bunch and uh, lot of stuff here. But what I would like to do is do a small bit of an exercise. But for me, and Naresh as well, this, this really stands out because that's what XP war is all about. I mean, this is a personal journey, as I said. So if you look at XP values here, communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, and respect. If you look at various uh, XP practices, pay programming, right, from collective ownership, on-site customer, refactoring, simple design, so on and so forth. If I were to take the earlier table and try to apply that to XP practices and map them, First of all, communication and feedback, they are the tools, right? Tools that lead to the ideal of truth. How effectively are you using those? Between, between you, the outer you, and the inner you, what is the gap? How much is the gap? Simplicity is an, ex is an ideal of a beauty and harmony. Courage, strength, and force. If I were to map XP practices, to me, refactoring simple design and coding standards, they, they are the ideal of beauty and harmony. Pair programming, collective ownership, on-site customer and system metaphor, equality, fraternity, and liberty. These are the ideals. Whereas, if you look at the planning game retrospectives, TDD continuous integration, small uh, releases, So, should we call it Agile Adoption? Well, I don't think so. We need to use feedback to permeate agility and manifest ideals. Not just at the team level, but at individual level. Because we know today that no amount of uh, you know, fiddling with these outer structures is going to help. The problem is right within. If we correct that problem first, the solution to other problems will be found. I would like to leave you with questions to ponder really, you know. And so if I were to say, would you be able to apply I, uh, this on a daily basis if yes or no? So what I mean by that is a uh, couple of slides back where I have all these stuff. What you could do is probably have a column here by the side and use this as your own evaluation sheet from le one to five, on level of one to five, find out how much do you exhibit any of these qualities on a scale of one to five. Then let's talk about your team. But first let's start with I. If there is a gap between what you are and what, what your outer self is, it's just hypocrisy. Yeah? So you could do that and you can do the trending. So when I attended this workshop at Sri Aurobindo uh, Society, I was really like, for me this was the aha moment. And I said, you know what? Agile to me is all this, really, at core. So, just, yeah. So, also, if there, are, if there are HR people in this room, we also should be talking about, you know, not just HR, but anybody else as well in the room. How many of us really talk about, uh, in the JDs, right, that we publish, we just look at matching skills, right? What is the psychological disposition, uh, psychological content of the job? Have we ever tried to match the psychological content of the job to that of an individual? I have yet to see. If you come across, please send it to me. <laughs> but 
I think this is this is what we need to do. And secondly, I mean, this is this is the real question: inner values and outer action. So, moment you have your inner coming forth, that's the values in practice. Sure. Yep. That's it. There are some questions to ponder oh, sure. on, and then some questions to ask now. Anyone has any questions so far? We've done some the workshop with you. Keep picking. Keep on. So we are basically talking about mapping the values with the job, right? Or mapping the job to the values. Now, how is it different from the other HR tools that have been used, like the MBA API analysis and those kinds of things, uh, where uh, where people are evaluated and then based on that they are assigned. Uh, I mean, some analysis is performed that this person is good for this, this person may be good for this, and so on and so forth. How is this going to be different? I, I'm not, I've not used those tools, but what I'm trying to ask is the real psychological content of the job with, with the values that a person individual has. So I don't know what the tool does, but if it does help you with that, then that's, that's really good. But my question is, uh, we just do a superficial matching. Uh, for example, Java, person who knows Java 8, GMS 2.0, it's like asking for a carpenter who knows how to operate Black & Decker 3000 and uh, something else in that combination. Because for an employee and everybody to be truly happy, one should be able to express oneself. Then only all these things would just follow. Because that source if we have not that. So, so I've seen companies where they do use uh, some of the techniques you talked about or doing some other anal analysis on people. They give them different kinds of uh, brain tests and then they, you know, like speed versus uh, accuracy tests and things like that. And they try and see how, where people would map and then they put through an algorithm which would say, okay, you know, this person is good at the, or this person exhibits these values while this person is weak on these values. And then based on that, you might decide what position this person would be good to play a role or, you know, if this person is good to fit. But I'm not sure, you know, I've personally used this at a couple of companies. I'm not sure if always we can actually have, a, a, you know, a good uh, result coming out of that because sometimes people can game those things, right? So what we are trying to get here is essentially instead of having this kind of a test, you know, can we sit down and have an open conversation about it? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. And that's why there are specialists who do that job. They help companies to do this matching better. Yep. They help individuals. So, so what I'm trying to say is that this is uh, something that people are already practicing in certain ways, yep. though in probably different forms. So you are talking about values. They will talk about different types of individuals and what those uh, uh, I versus E, what those things map to. So again, no new techniques uh, in, in that sense, but uh, a different perspective at the same problem. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? Questions, comments? So this is with respect to the test driven development exercise that we did. Uh, so you highlighted that there are two web kinds of methodologies to that can be adopted for doing test driven development is outside and inside out. So based on your overall experience, uh, which approach suits most in terms of evolving the overall design of the software and why you can just elaborate on that, that would help us. So uh, there is a paper I wrote for IEEE, it's called Avatars of Test Driven Development. You can look at that and uh, the summary of that paper is there are many different styles of doing test driven development. Broadly you can classify them into two categories. Uh, and you know you typically will end up using a combination of both. So no one true way can lead you to Nirvana. Okay. We'll go there. If you can just pass the thanks. Hey, um, uh, thank you. Um, I think. Uh, 
this subject is far deeper than we can do in, in probably the time that you covered it. Uh, it spans more from, you know, coming out from the world of an IT professional to being an individual and an I and then going beyond the I, which is, uh, uh, which is evolution uh, for a human being. And, and uh, you know, I'm very interested in the subject and, and I've been learning also from a guru. So, uh, you know, I, it amazes me that you can actually put test-driven development and retrospectives in the context of values and principles and things like that. Um, what's challenging is that in an organization, I see people come from uh, different walks of life with different experiences, different levels of knowledge. Uh, they are technically sound, but as you say, you know, while you're hiring people, all you look for is technical skills most of the time. And um, very little attention is given to people's attitudes, uh, uh, what values they have, what beliefs they come with. And it can corrode the team if you pick the wrong people who come into the organization. And despite all the knowledge or the skills that they possess, that they can come and actually make or break a team. Uh, so we've gone through a journey uh, in our very organization where we've come from a place where all of us were together for a long time, uh, knew each other, knew each other deeply as families, to becoming a very large organization where things have kind of diluted, moved away, new people have come in. And we've seen this happen. So uh, the long, long story short, I think it's, it, it's a great start uh, to a journey uh, and it's a good uh, way of you know, applying the principles and the values that you have in life to your workplace. So thank you and I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Actually, just, uh, just to add to what you said, uh, our uh, individuals are just the same. There's no difference in, I reject the notion of professional life being different from personal because it just doesn't work. And if you are not that, you wouldn't exhibit that in your work as well. So. Thanks. I think the genius behind some of this work has been Ken Beck. I think we should give him credit because Ken Beck, when he started with uh, Extreme Programming, uh, not just Ken Beck, but I think uh, Ward Cunningham as well. These are two guys who really, you know, they're focusing a lot when they wrote Extreme Programming. They just put a bunch of practices and said, here, go do these practices. They talked a lot, if you look at the first Extreme Programming book or if you go to the C2 Wiki, uh, they talk a lot about the values and why these values are important and even to be able to distill down into these values, I think it's, it takes a lot of insight and it takes a lot of experience to be able to distill things down into values and then build on top of the values and then talk about principles. And uh, Ken Beck has done that even at a design level. So he talks about when you're programming and you're designing, you know, there are certain values and, you know, how design patterns are influenced by those values and what trade-offs you make when you do this. So my, when, when, when I was looking at it, and I think we had that aha moment about, you know, how, uh, while these guys have mapped this out, we can step back and then take it a little further, like outside the quote-unquote software context like we were talking. You can actually expand it into something more, bigger in terms of the ideals. And that seemed like, you know, an interesting uh, experiment to run, uh, to start with. It's like, actually, can you do this mapping? I mean, these guys are geniuses. They have, they have spent lots of years coming up with this. Can you step back and further expand or build on top of it? So this is a little experiment just trying to do that. And actually, uh, if you see uh, the earlier slides where I say about this, um, it talks about universal Values. So certainly whatever work that we are doing, if it doesn't tie back to that universal value, then there is a big disconnect. It, it just doesn't work. So the values in specific context have to tie back to the universal values at a certain level. And if it doesn't happen, then yeah. So that's the... <laughs> And what you talk about is as the organization evolves, right? And that's pretty common to see. And so I think, uh, you know, we need to embrace that rather than try to fight it. Because all organizations go through what we call as the adaptive change cycle. Right? You start as a very small, close-knit community of people working very closely together. I mean, look at startups, right? When they start, they're really this close-knit community of people. And as they evolve, you know, the company grows, the focuses, the, the values change. Uh, and the company goes around and in many cases it turns around, falls back and then forms a, you know, resurfaces itself in a different way. And this is, you know, a very common thing 
not just in software companies but in nature. So you know it's it's pretty evident as well. So we need to embrace it in my opinion. Yeah. I think we have one question here. <laughs> I just had a comment to me is with my limited experience uh, working with my organization during the recruitment process, I have noticed that as it is, it's very tough to find people who will match those technical skills. So I can understand adding an additional layer of these values, I think companies find very tough. Because then what are the odds of finding someone who can map skills and values as well? I think that's where I think where we are in choosing. Yeah, I think, uh, so I've worked with many companies where uh, we put a very strong stand on well, we'll reject business if we don't have the right kind of people. And I think a lot of people know those companies today and the reason we got there, I strongly believe, is because we focused very hard on people and we said it's okay to lose business. It's okay if you don't build a new product, but let's focus on having the right set of people. Every new hire you bring in, A, from a value standpoint, they align with the organization, but more importantly, they bring diversity into the organization, which means they you know, push the bar of everyone one notch up. And out of 10,000 interviews, you might find one. Right? Th that's those are the odds. But once you start getting there and people start knowing you, then your odds become better. Right? So it is about are you willing to, you know, put in that time and effort and painless journey till you actually start seeing that. So today some of these organizations have thousand people. I mean thousand is, is a big army. It can change the world. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't have a question, it's a comment, you know. This day has been different, you know. We started with you know on a topic safety, which was very different. This topic, you know, first 15 minutes, I'll be honest, I thought, you know, to apply the law of two feet and you know walk when you guys were writing that crappy code. Yes. Uh, but eventually, you know, the subject of you know the ceremonies or the ceremonies or you know this turning into the practices and you know how practices ties to principles and to values. And then you know going to the individual eye, I think you know that was really fantastic. Uh, so the message that I'm getting is that you know just to see what's there in the market. You know, be the agile different methodologies under agile and keep one thing in mind that you know continuous improvement where we are what things suits us you know apply those and it starts doing the evolution so i think a wonderful topic you know i would like to give a thank for the presentation and you know about the school values okay you made our day thank you <laughs>